nobody gave us anything. We earned what we got. It started back from my childhood when my parents always told us, say, you're not any better than anyone else, but never forget no one else is any better than you. Growing up in Midland, the neighborhood I lived in, it was all black with a few Serbians, not Italians. All right, in later years, they moved out and it was all black. Black people did not live beyond Fifth Street. And the first thing I experienced growing up is when we went to a movie and the movie was segregated. The black had a section and the white had two sections. So we decided that we were going to sit in the middle aisle. So we got two friends of ours to go with us. They was two boys, they went with us. We walk into the movies and we sit down in the middle aisle. Here comes the usher, flashlight. What are you doing sitting here? We said, to see the movie. Said, well, you know you're not supposed to be here. We didn't say anything. Well, you have to move. So we said, we all think so. We're comfortable here. He kept standing there with the flashlight on. We didn't think the movie was going to start. When they saw we weren't going to move, they left. And that's the first thing we started, and I started in segregation. Now, my niece wanted to be a cheerleader. I went to the principal. And I said that I want my niece to be a cheerleader because black could not, the boys could throw the ball, win the games, but the black girls couldn't be cheerleaders. The principal, well, I, and I don't know, we're not gonna have any, no, no, no. So I got a group together and we demanded we wanted a black cheerleader. But do you know what he did? He would not give it to my niece, but they did give it to somebody else black, but that was all right with me. I said, that's okay. But he's getting back at me. And then in school, my daughter, when she was uh, uh, going to the playhouse in Pittsburgh, learning the act. Okay. She takes uh, audition to be in this play. So the teachers told her, you cannot have the leading part because you're black. When Daphne came home and told me and her dad, I couldn't believe it. She said, Molly, he said, I could not have the leading part because I was a black. So the next evening, they happened to have open house. Stevie was with us and me and my husband, so we asked the teacher, well, I wouldn't expect for him. He said, yes, I said it. He said, I'm not gonna have the white parents get upset with me on account of your daughter. Well, I went to the principal of the school and the school board. But it was bittersweet though. They didn't have the play, which I thought they should have had the play and let her take the part but they didn't have the play whatsoever. And soon after that, he left. But it was a bittersweet thing to me. But then afterwards, she went to John Hopkins. She graduated from there and then went to the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. And she now is a doctor. On the 27th of August, my sister and my cousin, Dorothy James, we went to Pittsburgh and got on the freedom train. We arrived in uh, Washington on that, on that morning, on the 28th. All the people, people came by car, plane, train. They even said some of them had even hitchhiked their own bicycles every kind of way. It was so many people there. 
was unbelievable. There was over 250,000 people there. We couldn't even get anything to eat. And I, 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 we ran into my sister-in-law from Erie, and she had some food in a little bag. <laughs> but anyway, it was a feeling, though. We was all as one, black, white, Christian, Jews, all of us, all as one. And when I, they had all these speeches, but everybody know the story of Dr. King's speech. I have a dream. With all those people there, it was so quiet. And even when he got out there and gave that speech, it was, it was like I said, it wasn't even black and white. We was all as one. And when he gave that speech, you couldn't help but just have a feeling in you. That feeling just made you want to rededicate yourself to the movement. Uh-huh, just, we came back rededicated. We came back and made us want to do more. We fought more for our rights than ever before. We didn't have any blacks in any of the groceries, but we had this one big grocery store, a and &P. And we had two banks. No, nobody, no black. So we went to uh, the banks. They said no. Went to the grocery store. No. So we got together. A group of us got together. We met on Fifth Street in front of First Baptist Church. We marched down to the Burr Building. We talked to them. And so, no good. Then we kept on marching. And we said we demand for someone to be in there. Okay, then the mayor of Midland came to me. He said, we'll start the Human Relation Commission. That's how it started. And talk things out. We had somebody at the bank. We had somebody at the grocery store. We didn't do this alone as just black people here in Midland. There was a minister in industry. Reverend Nelson, he was from the Lutheran Church. And there was a priest, Father McLevine, 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 Catholic priest. They helped us. They marched with us. And so this minister in industry, he said, let's have service together. We went to his church. He came to our church. That brought us closer together. And there was a couple in middle, I'll never forget. George and Julia McClyde. He, he had a, he ran a gasoline station. Anyway, they fought with us to the end. And he even lost some of his businesses on account of us. So it's not a black and white thing. It's a right and wrong thing. We got there at the inauguration, my sister and I, and my daughter, and my nephew. <clears throat> so, of course, I was in a uh, wheelchair. He took me in, and do you know, I was sitting on the front row at the inauguration on the left side. Me and my sister talk about that to this day. And then they had like a service man there. I even had I even had to go to the restroom here. The service man came. I said, oh, no, no, no. I'm going to the restroom. He said, that's all right. He helped me there. He said, I'm just going to stand outside the door. The people there. And it was just like people came from everywhere. And uh, uh, we were there just as one. I never thought I would live to see a day like that.
I said, all of this that we had been fighting for, for the sea, and I was thankful that the Lord let me see the first black president of the United States of America. It's a feeling that I couldn't even describe. And I'll never forget it. I felt like everything we had done, all the work, the tears, and everything, the tears we shed, all the marches we had and everything, it was worth every bit of it to see a black man standing up there, president of the United States of America. My children have assisted me in various community projects by preparing and assisting me. I'm so proud that as, as adults, they continue to encourage young people by volunteering through the use of their skills and talents. And my son Aaron, who is in Los Angeles and is a retired teacher and football coach, spent many hours with urban students and as a volunteer, mentoring and coaching in basketball, football, and track. After school, he would transport a lot of the students home, and on the way home, he would stop and buy their dinner or do whatever he could for them. And many of them now have achieved their goals by attending and completing college. Stephanie has always been a creative person and planning programs and creating gifts to uplift people in our church and community. She has always loved to volunteer in youth oriented programs. She was the youth director of our church for, oh, I would say over 30 years. She now serves on two boards in, in the community. Most of all, she has led and played a major role in the Midland Women's Civic Club by chairing our annual Dr. Martin Luther King event. And she also used to chair our Black History programs too for the Civic Club.